Ladies and gentlemen, it's Ted, CEO and co-founder of SecurityGate.io. So excited to be here at CS4CA Virtual Houston this year. Wish we were in person, but in the absence, we've got a really great uh, topic to talk about. And I'm going to be joined by one of our customers, Chevron, today to help us do that. One of the biggest challenges that companies that are conducting cyber assessments in industrial control system environments or in operational environments, they always have challenges with their overall assessment and remediation program. Maybe it's not enough resources, maybe there's not enough time, and maybe you don't have the right people on your staff. Regardless of your size of your company or your program objectives, the bottom line is that there are probably a couple companies that have been there before, either made some mistakes or learned from them effectively. And so when we put together the content for this, this event, we wanted to bring in some of the industry's best and the brightest. And today I'm going to be joined by Chevron today, who's going to give us an understanding of what it's like in a five to six year program from what we call prepare phase, where they're actually selecting out the framework they're going to use, to baseline, where they're conducting their initial assessments across a very, very large ecosystem, all the way to accelerate, where they're going to be digitizing that effort. There's things that you can learn. Our hope is whether you are uh, extremely accelerated in your understanding of this market space or you're brand new, our hope is, is that you walk away in the next 20 minutes with something uh, to take back to your own ecosystem. Thanks so much, and I hope you enjoy the video. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching, even if it is only virtual. My name is Ted Gutierrez, CEO and co-founder of SecurityGate, and I'm joined by my good friend from Chevron, Kenny Mesker. Uh, Kenny, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, you know, as we were having our discussion prior to, obviously, the video, uh, one of the things that we talked about was how companies have robust challenges when it comes to people, process, and, and, uh, and, and their time when they want to roll out a, a major cybersecurity assessment or remediation initiative. And so I hope we can talk a little bit about that today. But um, why don't you tell uh, the audience a little bit about your role at Chevron and how you kind of came to to really uh, owning this re this responsibility so that they have a little bit of understanding of, of some of the things that you've gotten done in the last decade. Sure. So um, I, I came to Chevron principally as a, my background is in process control and I'm, a, I'm an electrical engineer by education and um, spent my entire career in one way or another dealing with industrial control systems. And, and when I came into Chevron, I, I actually started out in pipeline doing process control support. Um, sort of the same thing I'd been doing for a long time. And I, 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 I found an interest in cybersecurity and started poking around and wound up over in the cybersecurity side of the house, which was in our, our primarily engineering, central engineering teams. Um, when I got there, uh, I was somewhat disappointed in the way we were uh, doing risk identification and assessment and those sorts of things. And so what I did was um, I, I leveraged one of the very great benefits of working for a company like Chevron. I leveraged the ability to uh, sort of blazed my own trail. Um, I, I saw something and I owned it and started chasing down this idea that, you know, we can be better about how we do risk identification, how we do assurance of cybersecurity posture and those sorts of things. So in a lot of ways, I, I kind of invented my own job. Right. Well, I think that uh, kudos to you for having the, uh, the initiative to do that and having the resources behind you to, to, to make that a reality. Can you give us a, a little bit of a uh, an overview when you talk about some of the things that you had in this initiative, if we can call it that, how did it kind of start and, and what are the major milestones so that we can give the audience an understanding of what has the last five to seven years been like? What were the key milestones? And then what we'll do immediately after that is we'll dive in a little bit on how to be successful at those different milestones. So, you know, where did it start and, and how does it look today comparatively? Yeah, so I would say the journey for me starts right around 2012. So we're, we're about seven, eight years uh, into it now. And at that time, it was very common to have to explain what I literally do for a living to people within my own company. Right. Um, I had that question a lot. You know, I'm here, I'm talking about cybersecurity. I'm talking about risk management. And I'm talking to people from, from my background who do you know, operational type things. And there was oftentimes a, well, you know, aren't you just trying to make my life harder? There's no historical reason for us to be doing all this cybersecurity stuff. You know, there, there was a lot of pushback and it was a cultural shift that was needed. OK, so in that environment, I spent a lot of time explaining why we need to be focusing on cybersecurity in their operational environment. The, the way I usually describe it is you have people who, for a living, turn hydrocarbons into money. Right. And they're not really thinking about cybersecurity outside of how it affects or sometimes makes their job a hard, little harder. And um, when you're setting when you're setting prioritization, you really have to win that audience over. 
And so I, I started there. And I started looking for a way to get what I was ca not calling, but what is is assurance. Okay. So when we talk about cybersecurity or risk management or any of those ways that we normally describe these things, really what we're looking for is a way to assure ourselves that we're meeting certain expectations. That sounds simple, but at the end of the day, you really have to define what you mean by I'm assured and what expectation means. And, and, and you have to get all the key stakeholders aligned. <laughs> and, and, and you yep. have to get the resources to make it happen. Yep. You know, one of the things that we find is that there's a lot of talk about it. Maybe there's one key leader in an organization that says, we will go this direction, we will do this. But it really does take an army. And whether that's at a small company or a major operator, mm -hmm. how uh, would you say that, how would you help a, a younger company in their stage of, of cyber program maturity? align with the key stakeholders, whether those are operational folks, whether it's getting IT people on your team. Mm -hmm. how, what do you think um, is something that other folks in the audience could, could benefit from? Sure. So I, I mentioned expectations, so that has many connotations. But um, I would say the first step that, that I had to go through mm -hmm. was convincing our stakeholders that th these are important topics and sort of erasing the history of previous, because a lot of times when you speak to people in my, in my world where they're industrial control system experts and they're doing operational things, uh -huh. um, they have a bad taste that IT is left in the mouth over time, right? right? Because, you know, IT typically isn't thinking of it from their perspective, isn't thinking of the operational disruption, mm -hmm. the, the consequences and impacts that are involved in what they're doing. And that's no one's fault per se. It's right. just two cultures that aren't normally very mixed or heterogeneous, right? And so. Um, the first step is you you need to get the stakeholders committed to helping you solve the problem for them. Right? Well, they have to identify it's a really problem. You have to yep. align on that. Mm -hmm. It sounds like getting everybody aligned on a key purpose of yep. the overall cyber assessment strategy life cycle. That's important. And furthermore, convincing them that you can be successful, right. um, that you're not just going to waste their time. And that's hard to do if you're not working with those folks every day. Right. Um, right. I, I recognize that. So. Uh, you also mentioned, so we're talking in the 2012, 2013 timeframe right now? When this journey started, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then so there were some major framework level initiatives that happened in that 2014 timeframe that right. you had shared earlier helped you. Yeah. Can you so, explain? Yeah, when, when I, uh, maybe a little bit more details in the background. So when I, when I started this journey in 2012, um, we were doing what we called straight up risk assessments. And that was about the only tool in our, in our toolbox was to go into a process control environment and the way I described it, it was not much better than taking a white pad and a pen right. and an expert and going in and just asking questions until you feel like you've identified enough risk, right? Or cyber risk. And, and people are doing the best they can. They're doing the best they can. And, and these people are subject matter experts, right. but at the same time, there's not consistent results. Right. Um, it's kind of confusing. And uh, no two reports are the same. And, and so I was very disappointed and unhappy with that. I, did, I didn't feel like that was providing any real assurance. A lot of times it resulted in busy work that we couldn't necessarily uh, measure or say and, we were and getting. And how long in your journey did you start seeing that happen and then you recognize that there has to be a little bit more, maybe not rigidity, but standardization to your process? So day one, really, really? Uh, one, or very early on in my time with uh, that portion of, of Chevron, I went as a, an, a, a, a someone who was sort of riding shotgun on a, on a risk assessment. So right. I was an observer for the most part and I walked away going, what was that, right? Like, I, I don't really feel like that did a lot for didn't us. Didn't hit the mark. Didn't hit the mark. And I said, okay, you know, I think we need to find a way to, A, unify our, our language. For just let's start there, right? If we're not using the same words, then we're clearly not having the same conversation. And so I started hunting for some method where we could all get, the, you know, all sort of standardized on the same on the language same, controls, like, language, things. taxonomy controls, and those sorts of things. And at the time, Across the industry, it was very discordant. There, there were a lot of different frameworks, a lot of different ways of approaching This is also and, before OTIT convergence, oh, divergence yeah. oh, yeah. really started getting talked about. You were living it before yeah. um, you know, a lot of teams started talking about it. You could get laughed out of a lot of rooms by talking about OTIT convergence at that time. Um, yeah, because it, just, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a thing. It wasn't a thing. And so um, right around, uh, it was 2013, February 2013, President Obama signed the executive order 13. 636, it's emblazoned in my memory forever, um, which essentially established that there was a requirement to have some sort of critical infrastructure framework for cybersecurity. And, and a year later, in 2014, um, exactly one year later, the cybersecurity framework, the critical, Protecting Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity Framework was released 
that met the objective of that executive order. And that was when the light bulb went off. Um, I did know some about it before it was formally released, but mm -hmm. you know, once it's since it's not out there, it's very difficult for me to take that to leadership to build any kind of strategy around it. And once that happened, I knew that a new door had opened because finally I had what I, what I call a taxonomy right. to have a conversation with anyone within the company or across the industry because we're all going to speak the same language now. Right. And if you're familiar with the NIST cybersecurity framework, um, it's quite simple, really. But at the end of the day, it gives you a way to have any conversation and fit any part of that conversation into this structure. Right. And so I can say, I'm going to talk about incident response or patch management or malware Software detection or, you know, inventory. it right. doesn't matter. There is a place for me to put that. And they've even improved it since, of course. Um, and that was the key that it opened was, the door. Right. And once that happened, I, I, could, I could start building the tools and the processes and the sorts of things I needed mm -hmm. to answer the questions that allow me to get assurance from the framework. So you're spending a couple years um, running around trying to get support. Once you start, started doing your assessments, you realized they were a little bit too subjective. There wasn't a standard taxonomy. Um, we've had frameworks released that gave you that capability to now say, we have a standard language that I can build upon. Mm -hmm. What was the next step you took? I'm assuming this is the 2014, 2015 time frame. So this is pretty much 2014 was when we, we got going here. and. Um, what had happened was there was uh, some leadership folks that I had run across in, in my journey. Mm -hmm. And we got back together again and we talked about, well, how can we get an overall, what we call a posture picture, right, right of our cybersecurity, you know, status or yeah. maturity or there's lots of words. Pick from 10 words. Target profiles, you know, of course. <laughs> a is, picture of, and you, you said that it was more about, uh, you didn't use the word risk. Correct. We very, very intentionally uh, avoided two words while we were doing this originally. One was the word risk and okay. the other was the word compliance. Right. Um, this was not risk-based and it wasn't compliance-based sure. at its face, right? And so what we really wanted to do was understand where our posture was bad or needed improvement. Understood. Maybe bad's not the right word, but needs improvement or there are gaps that we could identify so that we could then focus our resources and focus our time where we needed to and then go identify risk and develop compliance plans that would help us mitigate that risk without just using one brush to paint the entire company. Right? Understood. So you had a period of how long? I think we met in 2019. We did. There was four and a half, five years that you were actively um, conducting those posture assessments. Tell mm -hmm. us about that process. So interestingly enough, when that happened, um, Chevron, like most major oil and gas companies, or I think most companies in general, they focus um, a lot of their efforts on outside uh, audits. And so we'll have companies come along and they'll do outside cold eyes perspective uh, viewpoints on where we're at, you know, from a, in this case, cybersecurity posture. And that had been done at that same time. That was being done at that same time. And so that had been reported out to our board. Right. And our board, independently of and my effort. separate of your efforts. Yeah, independent of my Tell effort, came back and said, uh, cybersecurity posture is something that we feel needs to be worked on. Okay. Um, we're starting an initiative to accelerate that, that program. We are going to put the resources, and, and, and that includes people, financial, you know, you name it, right? Leadership support, stakeholder support, all of that, right. into accelerating our cybersecurity posture. That's the board. But that's the board. Okay. And so that was very timely because here I am having my aha moment about, you know, how I can start doing the these things. Stars aligned. The stars aligned, and it was the perfect timing. And what I was able to do at that point was develop a program where we, we got the resources in. Um, I developed the training. I developed the ability to what I call uh, uh, calibrate right. the teams. And we developed questionnaire sets, um, tools that were quite manual, right. the Excel-based tools, right, you know, spreadsheet-based tools. A lot of that's what I used about 10 yeah, years ago. Yeah, so at, it, that's, at, at you know, Shell. you so want something fine. fast, you go to Excel, right? Um, and so we, we developed uh, target profile right. calculations and weighting, and we did all the things we needed to do to arm an assessor to go to a, a customer in our internal customer. Which stakeholder. is a facility, right? Uh, Most often a facility, but an, an, an industrial control system within a particular business, operating business unit. Right. Right? So critical functions of your business. Yeah, yeah. Um, you wanted to gain an understanding of their overall cyber posture. Mm -hmm. You have a standardized framework now. You've got support from the board. You've got support from operational folks. Um, so how long did you run that initiative, if you will? So our initial goal was to do every facility in a year. 
and, and, and we and give did. us an idea of that scope. So, we don't so, have to be specific. Yeah. But, I mean, how hard was that to do? That was pretty hard to do. Uh -huh. um, and we, we have quite a large op operating population of facilities globally. Uh, globally right. Yeah. And, um, it, you know, it's in the several dozens of them, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was, a, that was a stretch goal. We really thought it would take closer to two years to pull off. Right. Um, we were able to do it in just under a year. We, we actually... So what, what advice would you give to companies? I always hear, hey, Ted, we, we really need to go and begin that assessment program. We need to accelerate it. But we have so many facilities globally. Mm -hmm. You know, what you just described in the last couple of minutes, I, I think a lot of people have challenges doing uh, or dealing with. So mm -hmm. what, would, what advice would you give to somebody who may not have all of the authority to run assessments, but he or she knows this is important? Right. Understanding that posture and being able to compare that posture to other facilities is the most important piece. Can you talk a little bit about right. that? You hit on the two most important aspects of it in my mind. One of the one of the challenges I would say is that you you need to convince the customer right. that when you come in, I mean, you are bringing a storm with you, right? I mean, yeah. it's it's going I to be I need your time, I need impactful your people, I need resources. For, you have you need to convince them and you need to design your program in such a way that it is the least impactful to them, right? right. And so I'm taking I get it. I'm taking 5 to 10 people offline for 4 or 5 days. Yeah. And that's expensive to mm -hmm. them, right? And so I've got to justify that time and I have to minimize it as much as possible. So we spend a lot of time with, uh, you know, it, it is a question, it is an interview style uh, assessment, um, actually grouping those interviews so that we only have the resources we need for the time we need them. You dialed it in. And then we released them. Right. And then the second part that, that you hit on right. is when I get the results, those results need to be comparable to other results, right? Or else, what's the point? If I'm not providing any sort of value back no to context. the customer, right? There's no context. And I'm doing, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 of these things. Right. I've got to be able to compare all of those results and say, this means something in context to the, the facility next door, right? Or else, again, we're back to, they're just independent metrics that don't yeah. have any meaning. Um, so we spent a lot of time understanding how we could get that calibration across the results. Well, and it took time, and, and, and it sounds like it took three to four, maybe five years to, to, for you to make the decision that now we need to accelerate these efforts. We, we've been in a uh, spreadsheet methodology. We've been on an on-site. I, mm -hmm. I believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that at Chevron, you gained the confidence that you dialed in your assessment strategy, mm -hmm. your, the questions you ask, what those questions mean. Um, and then you digitized it as part of what we see a, a digitization effort, whether it's digital transformation or whether it's moving to the cloud. We see a lot of companies doing that. What advice would you give to a company that may be at the same scale or smaller scale, has been doing some assessments and says, wow, I wish I could get away from a spreadsheet. Um, not because the fundamental question is different, but the way you can house the data, twist the data. When is the right time that somebody does that? And, and when do you recommend that they make that effort? So I have two answers. <laughs> I have sort of my experiential answer, um, which was it took us a couple of cycles yeah before we felt that we understood it well enough that it was time to automate. It was time to go digital transformation. Um, and, and Chevron currently is operating under a, a philosophy of, uh, we talked about this earlier, to succeed in any environment, right? And what that means is essentially do more with less yeah. and do it smart, right? Um, again, we're having that serendipity where the Chevron philosophy is, is dovetailing nicely what with what we want to do you next. You just need right? to keep, keep going because the, 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 uh, the global initiatives align it right with what you're It just seems to be working on. perfectly, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's one answer. Right. The other answer is why I could go back to the beginning with what I know now, mm -hmm. which I think companies can, with information sharing between us, I think there's a certain amount of, of that experience and knowledge that we can actually share that could get companies a lot further along than we were when we started, which was day yeah. one. And if I could do that, if I was coming at it with that perspective, where I had another company saying, hey, we learned eight years worth of lessons, let me give some of them to you, I probably could have started digitizing and automating upfront a, little a bit. lot of it. Yeah. I understand. Well, regardless, um, you know, we're coming down to, to really the last minute or two. There's a lot of OT leaders, IT leaders, people that have less experience, some people that have tons of experience. When you think about summing up uh, your talk today, what I would encourage you to think about, audience, is here's a gentleman that uh, 
is, is really living the ITOT convergence before it actually became something that is set in marketing. Um, and it's tough and it's challenging. Um, but if I had anything to say, would be giving you the last couple minutes here, how do you encourage your audience? How do you encourage the ecosystem out there, regardless of the time, resources, uh, the time, people, and the money available to them? How do they progress an understanding of their own assets or their vendor cyber maturity? Uh, what, what advice would you give them? So depending on the audience, I, I sometimes get a lot of support for this statement, and sometimes I get a little pushback. Go for it. But, this is uh, a safe place. Yeah. So what I would say is keep it simple. Right. And a lot of a lot of people, I think, are are confusing digital transformation with complexity, and they're confusing complexity with maturity. Because you can digitally transform. Why don't we start asking a thousand questions at a way deeper? level? Why don't we do right? everything Let's do all everything. at once, right? right? And and so. What happens is a lot of time you wind up with a product or a process or you know a methodology that doesn't really make sense to everyone. And because this is such a, a high buy-in stakeholder type of thing we're trying to do, you know, you have the people who want risk identified, which is your executives and your board, and you've got people who want you to leave them alone and let them do their job, which is usually your customers, and you've got people in the middle who are deeply concerned about assuring ourselves that we're you know doing this correctly. If you want everyone to play together, right. you really need to make it something that is accessible to all of them. And it's got to be kept simple. It's got to be kept very, very easy to adopt and, and get on board with. And then as time goes by, you can we start doing data analytics and machine learning and right. you know all of those types of things that we feel will extract more assurance, but don't start there. So don't chase the buzzwords just to chase Not, them. No, right? no, that's a bad idea. <laughs> well, Kenny, thanks so much for your time today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is... Um, a very unique and momentous moment where uh, we're learning from the best and the brightest as some of the world's largest chemical uh, oil and gas upstream downstream midstream companies on how to protect critical infrastructure and do so with either limited resources uh, or a lot of resources kenny thank you so much for your time thank and thanks you. for helping this country uh, and globally be safer when it comes to ot and it security thank you ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for spending your precious time with us today and i hope that you got as much out of the video as we did Hearing from people uh, like Kenny at companies like Chevron that have been there before uh, that can inspire us uh, to learn from, uh, from what they've been through, uh, that's why we're all in this industry together. So visit our booth. You can go ahead and check out some of the content that we have. You'll see a case study there for Chevron. And one of the other things that I'd invite you to do is enter uh, a drawing for a chance to win a $1,000 Amazon gift card. And you do that by messaging us at our digital booth at securitygate.io so that we can have a conversation with you. We want your feedback, we want your questions, and we want to be a resource to you. Once again, my name is Ted, co-founder of SecurityGate, and it has been my absolute pleasure being able to tell a little bit about the story of what we're seeing in the ICS environment. Uh, as we all go back, uh, whether it's COVID or not, let's all stay charged up to, uh, to secure our nation's critical infrastructure on a global scale. Thanks so much for visiting. Cheers.